<clears throat> hi, hi, what's up, what's up? I wanted to look at some stuff that's come out in Magic recently through the Mystery Booster format, which is a pretty exciting new thing that uh, Wizards tried doing at a recent event. I don't know how far distributed these packs are. I don't know if you can actually buy them in stores or they were for this event only, but there's some pretty crazy stuff in there. Uh, 14 out of the 15 cards are just reprints. Uh, they're reprints that come with their original framing, their original uh, set icon. I was hoping these would pop up so I could point it out. Only with just like an additional little symbol in the bottom left to indicate that they're a reprint from the Mystery Booster. So I think those probably were more for the limited format of the Mystery Booster rather than being kind of like big exciting reprints because I don't think this product, even if it is sold in stores, is going to be that wide a release. So it's not really a good way to kind of inject reprints back into the market. Um, but what's really, really exciting is that 15th card, which are these playtest cards. So at first I thought this was just going to be like a gimmick where... Uh, they gave you something in the format of a playtest card, but it was like maybe an earlier version or perhaps just the same version as an actual card that made it to market. But instead, these are cards we have never seen before, and in many cases, we've never seen anything like them before. Um, a lot of them seem to be kind of in jokes and stuff. I only looked at like three or four before I realized just how crazy this was and how I really wanted to make a video about it. Um, so I'm sure there will be a lot more that we can talk about. Uh, but yeah, these are cards that will never see the light of day in any actual legal format. They're much closer to something like an unset, like a silver-bordered set, uh, just for f casual fun among friends. So on the one hand, it's like a little disappointing. You know, you see all of these avenues that they considered going down, perhaps, um, but now we know definitively the door is closed. Um, at least for some level of specificness. But at the same time, these are things that we would have never even known about otherwise. So, uh, yeah, very exciting stuff. Let's let's plunge our way in. Oh my gosh, these are so crazy. Okay, we'll go full. And now we can see uh, the, the beautiful hand-drawn art. Um, and like a test card, it's supposed to be a sticker that they print off very quickly and then just stick on an existing card so they can shuffle it up and play it as normal. Um, but it's actually, in fact, when you get it from the Mystery Booster, just a normal piece of cardboard. It just has this appearance to add to the uh, playtest type thing. Uh, stuff like having as card name in the text, um, which is uh, how they, they refer to the card themselves internally because the card will change names many, many times and they don't want like a weird mismatch. Um, it's kind of funny here on the Oracle text version on Scryfall, they referred it back to the actual name. Okay, so what does this card actually do? If it enters the battlefield, you become a Bane. Your life total becomes equal to their loyalty. You can activate the loyalty abilities by spending or gaining life. So, what? How is this not just very strictly worse than just playing a Planeswalker? Do you still only get one activation? Do you get like a bonus activation because you can spend life on one and the Albane card can also spend loyalty on one? Uh, yeah, I don't know if this is any good. <laughs> it's seven mana. It reduces your life to five. Or I guess in some situations, increases your life to five. Um, this is pretty good. This is can be very good. This is really scary if it's like your life total. Yeah, I'm quite confused by this card. Um, I, I can tell why it never made to print. I don't see the benefit whatsoever of playing it. I don't know. Maybe I can look into this some more and uh, the, the value of this will be revealed to me. But this is the same mana cost as Big Karn. <laughs> Did you really play big card if it drops your life total to five and uh, did all this? Anyways, let's move on. Aggressive Craig, at the beginning of your combat step, tap Aggressive Craig. Ooh, hey, now that's pretty cool. Forces you to play stuff pre-combat. Um, but it's a very uh, good dual land. Hmm. Uh, 
What I don't like is that it's at the beginning of your combat step, so you can't use this to pay for combat tricks, which feels a little like out of flavor. Like, look, the mountain wants to fight. You should let it be able to cast Team or Battle Rage or whatever. Uh, but a cool design. Definitely something that they uh, probably left out just because it's very unintuitive. And it's not that exciting to just get a normal dual land when there's other conditional dual lands that you just jump through one hoop and then it's just as strong as this land. But it's a neat idea. A good thing. Whoa, look at this art. <sighs> Spells and abilities you control can't destroy, exile, target, or cause you to sacrifice a good thing. Okay. Oh, you control. At the beginning of your upkeep, double your life total. Then if you have a thousand or more life, you lose the game. So it's too much of a good thing. That's the, the kind of pun here. Uh, uh, so you can't get rid of it. You can't um, do your uh, the classic uh, grandeur of illusions trick, or illusions of grandeur trick. Or you play it, you gain the life, and then you donate it before you end up having to pay the life. Um, so yeah, because you can't even target it, so you still can't donate it. Your opponent can blow it up. They have to play a kind of a game where it's like, do I try to let them... I like how it still has the illustration credits. I don't know where those appear on the card. Maybe that's just something they knew. Um, the opponent is like, okay, how much life can I let them gain? Like, should I try to play the long game and see if they'll get all the way to a thousand? It just leads to really bad games, because then what is your opponent doing? They're no longer attacking. They're no longer trying to destroy your stuff because they're trying to win by a good thing. Yeah, this card is really ridiculous. <laughs> I, I don't know. It's it's a neat idea, but, like, I don't see how this leads to good gameplay at all. And because the whole idea is, like, you, the player of a good thing, can't really mess with a good thing, um, it's not like you can really do that much kind of clever deck building around it. The obvious thing is you run this with, like, Feldenar Guardian or, or uh, Battle of Endurance or whatever, things that just win you the game when you have thresholds of life. And then, of course, you hit that threshold... Much quicker than a thousand, and it's just like a two-turn or a two-card kill. Oh, it's all—it's all just very ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. Animate spell. Oh, it's so cute. Enchant instant or sorcery spell on the stack. Well, already we can tell why this not get printed. <laughs> Comes attached to an instant or sorcery. Put that card onto the battlefield under its owner control. It's a creature in addition to its other types with power and toughness each. Okay sacrifices it unless they cast it. Okay. So the use cases are they're playing something spooky. You animate it. The the best use for this, I think, is a counterspell counterspell, right? Uh, because you can use this to protect your spells, get them to go through. You hit their counterspell with this, it becomes a 2-2. Two -two. That's not really a big deal. And then when you kill it, for whatever reason. Um, when you kill either animate spell or just kill the card, the counter spell has nothing to cast. So this doesn't really work for like hijacking big spells because they get the spell eventually, probably. Or like, I, I don't really know how this works. Like, if it leaves the battlefield because I killed the thing this was attached to, uh, is there, do they still get this opportunity to cast it? Or is it already dead? Like, I think it dies first, then this dies as a state-based action, then they get a chance to cast it. So in the vast majority of situations, the creature just dies and the spell goes away too, I think. Eh, eh, I don't know, it's a neat idea. I think there's probably something like this that could see play. Uh, or maybe not. It's inherently very complicated. It's just so silly. Animate spell. Banding Sliver. Ah, uh, yes. So this one is just definitely a joke. There's no way they ever seriously intended to print this. These other ones so far, I feel like it was something sincerely thrown out as an idea and then thrown out as a bad idea into the trash. Um, whereas this one is obviously just them joking around because, of course, banding is a mechanic they have vowed repeatedly to never ever bring back because it 
it requires this much text to explain, <laughs> and it doesn't really lead to good or interesting gameplay at all, it's just not fun. Uh, so of course they would never ever put it on slivers. Hilarious. Bane Slayer Aspirant. Ooh, as long as you have one or more emblems. Cool. So this turns into a Bane Slayer Angel. Once, so that's like the, the reference in the name and, and kind of the, the joke behind the card. Most of these have either some crazy ass effect or I think are going to be like a, an in joke for magic. Uh, this is the first time that something is contingent on you having emblems. Emblems really are only generated by planeswalkers. Um, usually as like their alt or as a major downtick. And they just affect the state of the game permanently. Nothing messes with them. There's no way to remove emblems from the game right now. Um, you can just try to mitigate their effects. So the one that comes to mind is there's a Gideon who's minus or I think just a zero, you zero Gideon, and he creates that emblem that says you can't lose the game as long as you control a Gideon. So that plus this is an extremely brutally efficient beatdown. There's probably some other broken ones that I can't think of. I don't know if they stayed away from this design space because it is actually quite inherently broken, or if it's because they don't want anything to care about emblems, reference emblems, whatever. I'm not really sure why they would do that, because emblems, it's just another part of the game. It feels like that shouldn't be like a hard cut off design space. But maybe they're doing that to preserve the uniqueness of uh, emblems as like a game mechanic. I don't know. I don't know. Eh, it's neat. Okay, let's move on. Ah, Barry's Land. My gosh. So. Uh, whew. This is a long-ass story. This is something that is probably worth just looking for the article for. But when they introduced Wastes in uh, Oath of the Gatewatch, I, or whatever set that came out of, I think it was Oath. Yeah, it wasn't Battle for Zendikar, it was Oath. So they introduced Wastes as a basic colorless land, um, which of course opens the door for all sorts of basic land synergies and stuff. They talked about how there was Barry's Land as an idea that was kicked around for a long time. I thought Barry's Land was supposed to be a, a cave. I thought I remembered reading, but now it's a cloud. But whatever, it's the same idea. So this is kind of cool. I don't know. It's functionally the exact same as Wastes, because I don't think there's much that cares about Wastes specifically. So you could run this instead of Wastes if you wanted nice pleasant clouds instead of gross sludgy. Yeah, bear with sets mechanic. <laughs> Cute. This is, of course, something you'll see in almost every magic set. A 2-2 two, two for 2 that gets to have the set mechanic. Uh, this mechanic is pretty cool. I can see them actually doing this. They like their additional combat phases, but I guess only in some capacity. Like, only a few cards every once in a while will get the ability to give you additional combat phases. It gets out of hand quite quickly, I guess. But I like this, that it's a, a separate aggressive phase. To me, uh, the, the code word aggressive makes me think that there should be the additional combat phase before the first, during which only aggressive player uh, creatures can attack. But that's not as strong. This is like, it's like a separate bonus attack that makes blocking a lot more complicated. If there's like a smaller subset of your creatures attacking first, yeah, that, it doesn't lead to as uh, impactful gameplay. Um, but yeah, this is pretty cool. Uh, a downside is that I guess pretty much everything that has aggressive also needs to have vigilance. Um, otherwise, it won't be able to attack during the second attack phase. It can just attack during one of the two, which is like not as cool. Green typically does not get vigilance that often. I, I guess it, it's like tertiary in green. Questing beast had vigilance. Bind. Counter target activated ability. So this is a split card. They just didn't split it. Binds. Ooh, green getting target counter target activated ability. Ooh, hoo, 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 hoo. that's spicy. That's this is not currently in green's color pie. Maybe that's something they had genuinely considered. I like how they put the split card test 
print it on a split card. <laughs> um, okay, cool. I could see green getting this, maybe. Green has so much right now, though. Exile take as you control, bounce it. Okay, all right. That's that's cool. I don't have much to say about it. Art is cute. Biting remark. Ho ho ho! What? Oh my gosh, that's cool. I'm so sad they didn't do this. I mean, they've they've whenever they've kind of flirted with, oh, if you do it while doing this, it's for free. Like basking rootwalla is zero madness, so if you discard it, it's a free creature. Necromebia is like if you mill it from your grave from your deck into your graveyard, you get to cast it for free. Um, and generally, these cards are super busted, and Wizard seems to kind of regret playing them. I guess Basking Rootwall isn't actually that crazy, and Necromoeba is like, it's not really super necessary for Dredge to go off, it just helps Dredge go off. So I don't know, I think those are genuinely kind of safe. And discarding cards and milling cards from your, your library are, are much easier to do in large quantities than Scrying. Scrying is always like an additional cost. Scrying a lot, like Scrying more than one card, is usually quite expensive. Um, so I, I could see this being reasonable, like maybe not these specific stats, but some creature you get for free if you scry it, I think is so cool, and, and I feel like they could do it safely. And if it was strong enough to lead to like a chain scrying deck, which is all about cheating these creatures out, that would be cool too. I, I really have a hard time thinking that that deck would be like broken. Uh, if it was just strong, then I think that would be a pretty cool thing to see in the metagame. Yeah, I don't know. Blood Poet. Spark. Activate spark abilities by spending or giving yourself spark counters. Activate only one spark ability per turn and only as a sorcery. Okay. So it's like loyalty counters for the self. And I suppose all the creatures with spark overlap in this. So this I probably think turned into energy. This is probably like an early attempt to figure out how to do energy. And they they kind of used planeswalkers as a point of reference. Because this is kind of like a... Uh, how edgy? This is kind of like uh, the, the formatting of a planeswalker. Um, it's cool. I don't know. I think it's kind of cool. I'm not quite sure how uh, it works having... Multiple creatures with spark counters. I assume they all work for each other. So you can plus here and then immediately minus with someone else because you still have that spark counter. I don't know. That's cool. Bombardment. Until end of turn, cards you own that aren't on the battlefield lose all card types, cost names and abilities, and become red sorceries named missile that cost red with missile deals two damage to any target. Fun. A little convolutedly worded. Basically, it's saying, pay red, discard a card from your hand, deal two to any target. With the caveat that that's the only thing you can do with those cards. Now, this is just a way to kill everybody. <laughs> like, this is just the, the, the perfect endgame burn card. I, I don't see a way that this is not a completely busted card that just leads to some extremely degenerate play. But it's cute. It's cute. Like, there's the actual seismic assault decks, right? I don't think they've ever been amazing. Uh, but generally, I believe these decks tried to combo kill. You just deal all the damage of Seismic Assault on like one turn after dealing some damage maybe throughout the game until then with like normal burn. Um, but this is just, just discarding a land and it costs three. This costs one and it's entirely Whoa, wait, hold on. So the way this is worded, it's not just cards in your hand. It's... Uh, uh, I, I'm pretty sure this is all the cards you own in Exile. <laughs> right? So now you're... You're dumping all the cards you have in Exile back into your graveyard. So in Storm, putting aside the fact that you get to deal a whole bunch of damage, this is just like like, the most beautiful sequel to, to Past in Flames. You Past in Flames, you recast all your rituals, you cast Bombardment, you still own those re rituals in Exile, then you missile them back into the graveyard, 
including Pass and Flames. You, you missile Pass and Flames. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. I'm so glad this didn't get printed. What the hell? What were they thinking? Oh, my gosh. Wouldn't that be awesome, though? To have this card in cube and pull off that combo. Have this as part of your Stormwind con. Woo! Bone Rattler. Oh, that's cute. Okay, so... I mean, this isn't, like, a real crazy card in terms of what it does. The crazy part is that they think that they can get away with this. So this is a real card. Reassembling Skeleton. And, of course, it can come back from the graveyard. So the idea is you basically have this reserve of cards in your graveyard. You have, like, virtual card advantage. That's cool. But, like, what... Can you really do this? Say four reassembling skeleton token cards, and then you just look up what this is, and you make a token that has that stuff? Mm -mm. No. <laughs> uh, if Magic was a digital-only game, maybe. But there's no way they can actually get away with doing something like that. So, too bad. It's an interesting design space. It kind of reminds me of um, Mama Bear! <laughs> I love this card. Oh, what's it actually called? Mother Bear? Uh... Yeah, it's kind of, well, not really. It's a little like this. Okay. Bucket list. Whenever you cast a spell of a type showing on bucket list, put a counter over that type and draw a card. All five types on bucket list have counters over them. Sacrifice it and draw one more card. Okay, so this is something they've wanted to do for a while, and they keep kind of trying to find attempts at it, is a uh, kind of physically marking things on the card to indicate some progress or whatever. If you look up uh, sagas, I'm not going to bother looking it up, but look for the article talking about how they created sagas for uh, Dominaria. And it has kind of a similar thing where you're putting uh, a counter on the card and moving the cards around and, and the position of the counter on the card is like a relevant thing. I don't really like it too much just because it creates kind of a physicality to the game I don't like. Um, of course, practically you're already doing this. When you have a bunch of counters on a card and you're indicating it with like numbers on a dice, that has all the same kind of physicality risks and you could get bumped and jumbled and stuff, but I don't know. To, to kind of like inherently include that as an element of the card I don't know. Aside from that, I think that this, this design is really cool. It, it seems pushed. Um, kind of. I don't know. I, I it's hard to evaluate, which is which is what I like. I like a card like this. That's it's hard to evaluate whether or not this is powerful or useless. So I'm for it. Uh, in general, you may begin the game with buried ogre in your graveyard. If you do lose one life. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, 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 It's a cool idea, but there's a reason that Entomb is one of the strongest cards in the entire reanimator package. Getting the card you want into the graveyard is is ridiculously powerful. It's it's like a major obstacle that reanimator decks have to get over in order to go fast. To pay four life, to have four of these in your graveyard. And then on top of that, you start doing whatever other degenerate stuff you have to reanimate them. And then you probably have a sack engine. Maybe one that cares about power. And then things get, like, really absurd. <laughs> this is just so unnecessary. Reanimator is already plenty fast. Um, just Even if you just vanilla reanimate them and you have 24 power in play. Yeah, I don't know. No, no, no. no, no. Nice try. It's, it's cool. This is a cool line. But no. I don't think so. <laughs> Celestian Cave Witch. And above, create. Okay. And attacks, you may sack an insect when you do curse defending player. Create a black or a curse enchantment token that's attached to that player. It has an enchant player, and at the beginning of your upkeep, you lose one life. So, this is, of course, uh, there's all sorts of curses that, you're, that enchant the opponents. There's a few things that care about curses as a subtype. This plays really nicely with all of that. Um, yeah, I think this is really cool. I like that it has this like insect tribal theme too. You have other like insect generators that this can play off of. I feel like this one is actually pretty reasonable. I'm, I'm surprised they didn't really go down this avenue. 
I think the thing is, they've never done enchantment tokens before. They've never had a token enchanting someone before. There's probably all sorts of really crazy rules baggage that I'm not even like informed enough to be able to speculate on. Uh, that makes this look, that makes this like actually way more complicated than it looks. Cool art too. She looks badass. But yeah, I like this one. I, I'm, I'd like to see a deck built around this. Another curse payoffs. Chimney Goy! What? I love it! <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, so this is a reference to a very infamous magic card called Chimney Imp. It's often called one of the worst creatures of all time. Five mana gets you a 1-2 flyer. When it dies, they put a, the card from their hand onto the top of the library. <sighs> Honestly, like, this is actually a pretty powerful effect, like the Chittering Racks effect. Because you cut them off of a draw for one turn. In certain stalemates, this is, like, really strong. But the stats are just so terrible. Um, so this is definitely an improvement that it has the Tarmogoyf style uh, toughness setter. Oh, I love it. I love it. It's so cute. Look at it. Up on the, the rooftop. Um, <laughs> is this strong? I, I'm actually curious. For five mana to get a flying Tarmogoyf that has a non-negligible downside to the opponent when it dies. I'm so curious. I mean, I, it's definitely not powerful enough for like the fast formats, but I think it's standard. Maybe. Well, in standard, it's really hard to fill up the graveyard with card types. Man, I don't know. I love it, though. It's so cute. Chronobot. When it enters the battlefield, switch upkeep steps with target opponent for as long as it remains on the battlefield. You take your upkeep on their turn, and they take their upkeep on your turn. Whew! Talk about a logistics nightmare. My gosh. Uh, this certainly would teach you how a lot of very strange corner cases in the rules work very quickly. I think I love it. I hope they put this into a silver border set. This is perfect for a silver border set, I think. Where even if things get confusing, even if you start worrying that you're not executing the rules of the game properly, who really cares? Um, I think it could have so much potential as, I mean, I guess it's basically a silver border card already. It's legal anywhere that silver border cards are legal. So <laughs> yeah, wow. Let's see what people can do with this. It's so cute, too. Look, it's a little clock. The chronobot's got a clock face. Command the chaff. Look at target opponent's sideboard. You may cast a card from that sideboard without paying its mana cost. Exile, command the chaff. So here we see some infamous cards being referenced. Uh, that's Chimney Imp, of course, on the left. The guy in the middle is one with nothing. Uh, another infamously uh, undesirable card that typically reads as entirely useless, but actually has some kind of interesting corner cases, some fun things. Never really good, but, you know, interesting. Uh, it's, it's seven bucks. <laughs> and then this guy over here, I'm pretty sure is a mud hole. Yeah, uh, which again, really, really bad card. You could maybe come up with some obscene corner case for this, but what would it be? Like, what would it be? Some Crucible of Worlds deck that you've decided to sideboard against super specifically? So I guess the idea is that your opponent's sideboard is just full of garbage like this. But it's not really true. <laughs> this this actually could be an extremely powerful card in the right matchup. Um, there's, there's some decks that, like, their big fatty will rotate in and out of the sideboard, depending on the matchup. So you can swipe it. A very cool card. Uh, one that I think they could get away with in Black Border. But it's so swingy and matchup dependent that basically you have to price it into irreverence, irrelevance. If you tried to make this like competitively costed, it would be so matchup based that it wouldn't be fun to play against at all, actually. It's cute, though. Control win condition. <laughs> Straight up, this is the control win condition. Can be countered, Shroud. Power and toughness are each equal to the number of turns you've taken this game. This is in your deck, please keep track of your turns. This means you, Mark. So Mark Rosewater is uh, kind of infamous for always talking about memory issues and design. Uh, 
that, you know, for him, one of the worst sins in game design is just giving the players too much stuff that they just have to remember themselves that isn't actually indicated somewhere by the state of the game. So <clears throat> this is just a little dig at him. And, and also an acknowledgement that he is right, that it's unreasonable to expect players to track how many turns the game has gone on. Um, so, you know, if this is in your deck, you, you just, you just got to do it. That's, that's what it comes down to. So yeah, this thing is about as good as a control win condition you could ask for. It'd be nice if it had some sort of evasion, but evade what? You're supposed to counter everything. Draw go, baby. Uh, yeah, this thing is probably, would be like really widely hated if it existed. <laughs> okay, um, I'm going to split this video up because I have a lot to say about pretty much all of these cards, and I don't know how many there are. Oh my gosh, there's seven pages. So I hope you're enjoying looking at these. I'm really, really enjoying looking at these. This is like absolutely crazy. I never thought I would get to see a set this condensed of craziness. Uh, so yeah, we're going to plunge back into it. See you tomorrow with another set of cards. Bye-bye.